Hey, it is the Tuesday after World Open War 24 and I'm back in my own game room. And uh, I've already done a lot of analysis of what I experienced there. Um, so let me show you what I learned from going to World Open War 24. I've done the PowerPoint. Let me just set it up. Here we go. So these are the results and also there's going to be uh, quite a bit of me reflecting on what this has taught me about V3. So the agenda will be first up we'll talk about who won. We'll have a brief look, not an in-depth analysis, but we'll have a brief look at the winners lists. There'll be a link in the description if you want to go check out the lists yourself. Um, I don't want to go into details with that right now. Remember that for World Open War, um, the lists are a little bit skewed because it's a team tournament. So you could basically decide what type of mission you wanted to play, what table you wanted to play on, um, which made a huge difference for some teams. And for some teams that meant that, that they had made three very different lists, like lists that could do different things. We had tried to do that. Um, some teams didn't. And uh, yeah, we'll also talk about the tables, the missions, my own predictions. And then I will get into a little bit of a reflection. Uh, I will bring up um, four problem areas or issues that I think we need to deal with in V3. I've talked about most of these before. Um, so there'll be uh, gun lines, close quarters, uh, skirmishes, which is a new one, and armor. And then at the end, I will uh, sort of summarize in potential takeaways and yeah. So the winners were Spain. Again, they take a world championships, this time in three-man bold action. Um, and it was, a co of course, uh, as you see here, Carlos, Achilles and Hano who sit there with their trophy and their stars on the chest for having won world championships. Um, these guys are all amazing players and I think one of the things that really makes the Spanish team so good because individually I've I've uh, played against Hano, I've played against Achilles several times. Uh, I have yet to play Carlos actually, um, but I've I've uh, played against and won against and uh, lost against Achilles as well, but uh, no, no, I think I've actually only won against Achilles. Anyways, he's really good anyways. So it's not that they are individually necessarily the best in the world, although they are clearly in that bracket, but it's the combined strength of that team. They are very consistent. They are very disciplined. They're very, very good at what they do individually. Um, so as players, I was, this was always a possibility that they would take home the trophy again, right? For every single tournament that these guys turn up in, it is a possibility that one of them, most often Achilles, but one of them will take home the trophy. Um, in the second bracket, which was uh, Manuel's Germany, um, with Thomas and Martin, and they were they they're obviously also a very good team. Um, so Manuel has been individually number one at several world championships. He is an extremely accomplished player. Um, I think by now, Manuel, if you're watching this, I think you're one up on me uh, in our internal like um, accounting of of our games, how they've gone. So that's always brilliant, and. Um, and then Poland um, came third on the Kristov. Also very, very good players. They had a, uh, whereas Spain had a lot of tanks, Germany had a lot of multi-rocket launchers and, and uh, guns sitting in the back line. And Poland again had leaned more into tanks um, in their lists. And then we had England um, with Johnny Curran on that team. Um, which was a a team that had 
list that was a little bit different to what we were seeing in these other brackets. Unfortunately, they, they couldn't quite make it against the top uh, nations of Spain and Germany and Poland. So they, they came forth. In the second bracket, America, uh, the US Swans, with the youngest player at the tournament, Colton. Um, they take the first bracket. They are amazing guys, really cool, very, very accomplished. And um, we had the, uh, the honor of playing them in the second bracket. Um, along with Wales, and then us, Denmark, and the South Coast Pirates. So that was the re results. Then, like, the rest of them, they, they were in the lower brackets, so I, I won't bother with them, but there was also, of course, eight other teams, all of them. Thank you so much for turning up. Thank you so much for a very enjoyable weekend. It was lovely seeing you all again. Um, so, yeah. The winners list, the Spanish Carlos was bringing a low order dice list, which had 16 order dice, but he had so much armor. German auto cannon panzers. They are a thing, ladies and gentlemen. They really are a thing. Those German auto like looks and and two two twos and uh, two fifty slash nines. That type of vehicle, really effective. Really good, really good um, for the points as well. And in version 2, they are absolutely deadly. Achilles ran his 21 order dice finish list with lots of T20s and tanks. And it was amazing to see that all the finish lists at this tournament were actually finished armor. Like, there wasn't a single city unit, I think, which, like, that was the one unit that everyone took. And, and they didn't. These guys didn't. That was not what they were focused on. They were focused on cheap armor. I thought this was mental. I still think it's mental. I don't understand why this works. But both, at least two of the players who played Finns at this tournament said to me, this is the way to go. I don't know why. The T20s, though, they were very cheap. Um, so there was a huge discount for um, unreliable. And then Harrow had a 16 order dice uh, bridge list with Stuarts, the old style darker Stuarts. So obviously they are still a thing. They're not everywhere. Uh, the Auto Cannon Panzers absolutely beat them in numbers, but they are still viable to run. So the Spanish armor is king. That that must that must be said here. Germany had leaned much more into gun lining. Uh, so Manuel had 24 order dice, the maximum order dice you could take of Hungarians with multi-rocket launchers, a horde of inexperienced dudes, and then tanks to back up and be his maneuver element of the list. So it was actually a list where he could, he could throw out a meat shield, he could sit behind it and shoot, and then have an armored fist that could maneuver as well. So it's a three tiered list. I really like the list, although I hate playing against that type of list uh, myself, and I think it's uh, not fun to play against, but it's it's well thought out, and he played it brilliantly. Um, and of course, because he could, the, the uh, Germans could maneuver the multi-rocket launchers onto tables that favored multi-rocket launchers, that is a very good idea for a team tournament. The uh, Thomas Thomas Waterman ran a 22 order dice finish list. Again, T20s and tanks. I do not understand this. Someone has to teach me what that is all about. Um, and then Martin ran a 20 order dice German list with, again, multi-rocket launchers and tanks. So you see a sort of theme in the German list here, right? Tanks, if you can take them. Multi-rocket launchers, if you can take them. Um, that that was that was the theme for that, and I think it's really clever because we're very early in version three. None of us really know what we're doing at this point. So what Manuel and Thomas and Martin did here was they ran stuff they knew would work, because it wasn't changed that much. Right. Um, what about the tables? Well, um, first up, the tables were massively fun. If you don't know the tables at South End are 3D tables, so they're all like contoured and stuff. You you get hills, some of them are really large, like massive, 
massive hills. Um, and they were actually much better than the online pictures gave them credit for. There was a little bit of, oh, oh these tables are very open. Oh, uh, I didn't feel like that when I was on the tables at all. There was some issues with the terrain, but I'll get back to that. But, but for me, um, the tables were actually perfectly fine. They would have been um, way above standard for tournament tables in version 2. They would have been absolutely acceptable in my own own home tables and absolutely acceptable in my tournaments. They were not lacking in uh, terrain. However, I think we need a bit more terrain on version 3 tables. And I'll get back to why that is. And maybe especially we need it in the center of the table. Um, because we need to block a little bit more line of sight than we used to. Um, I am going to continue harping on about this, but I think we need 25% plus more terrain on our tables for version 3. And there are very few tables who had very, very specific issues. Um, like there was one table where uh, there was a bunch of houses on it and, um, and there was um, objectives on that table and you could only access the houses via one side. So that meant that the player who had that side had a massive advantage because the other player had to go around the house so that he was standing with his back to the enemy to go inside the house. And that, uh, that just didn't work out, right? You need more access points and especially from different sides of so there were a few tables that had these very, very specific issues with the single table, but that is stuff that you can most often only find out when you play the tables. Missions. So, um, wow, uh, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> my, my presentation uh, isn't where it should be. Anyways, I'll go back here. So the missions, the missions, were actually kind of good. There was a spread of objective missions, of kill point missions, of land grab missions, and then there were a few odd ones. Um, and it was most often the odd ones where it maybe didn't work quite so well. There was one that had confused fighting. There was uh, one where you had to have engineers in order to win the mission. And those sorts of missions, and there were one or two where you had a massive advantage if you won the first roll off um, to be attacker or defender. Those I think should be limited uh, to fun events or home games because they're really fun, but uh, I don't think they're massively fair at a tournament. So, so th that maybe should be taken out. Um, but like 95% of the missions were perfectly fine. Right, then we had my predictions. So, and this is, you can see, I, I basically um, <clears throat> had a copying error here. Anyways, so what I predicted was that gun lines would dominate. That is exactly what happened. There were so many gun lines at World Open War. And um, I'll get back to this as a problem in a minute because we did a little bit of math on it. But if you look in the top brackets, like Germany and Spain, you'll see that Germany had gun lines, right? They had absolutely had their, in this case, multi-rocket launchers bombarding you, right? And there were so many bombardment lists. That's also one of my points, right? So multi-rocket launchers, air observers and uh, artillery observers, that was a thing. One guy, Johnny, hi Johnny, even brought three artillery observers um, that had double shots. So he had six shots with his artillery observers. He could plaster you with shots. Um, I saw a lot of MSU, so multiple small units. Not all of it worked, I have to say. Um, forward deployers, I also saw quite a lot of that. Infiltrators, as they're now called. Um, especially the Soviet scouts, they were massively successful, um, including my own. Uh, and bombardment list and, and multi-rocket launcher spam. All that, all that 
panned out. That was the predictions. That is what I saw. And the only thing that didn't really work all that well or hmm, needs a little bit of, of, of work. So the gun lines are really good in version 3. Um, the forward deployers are really good in version 3. The bombardment lists and the multi-rocket launcher spam is really good in version 3. But the MSU, the MSU really needs ranged weapons to be able to reach out and and uh, impact the enemy at range. If you don't have that, MSU is not good. So rifles are no longer enough. So that was one of the things, one of the things that we saw. Um, and yes, the assaults were missing. The assault lists were out. Um, and there were some assaults during the weekend, but very, very few. The barbecue list, there was one, uh, Johnny, uh, Curran, who was playing for England. He brought a barbecue list and he did, uh, really well with it. But having only one person doesn't give us enough data to, to predict whether or not barbecuing will be out or might make a comeback. So, what is it with the gun lines? There is a problem here. That was one of the things that we saw. So, after the, the tournament, I sort of had a little interview with the 16s. I was traveling back, so they were all available, right? So, we sat down one-on-one -on -one and I... I Talk them. They they talk me through their games. I sort of asked them a couple of questions. So, in total, we talked. I talked about thirty six games. Six games times six games, right? Um, twenty one of those thirty six games. Twenty one was won by the player who did not move up. The passive player who sat back in his deployment zone where he initially deployed because some of them were like infiltrating up a little bit maybe but the player who just sat back and shot only five games were won by the player who actively tried to maneuver forward and do stuff that is a problem that is a problem and it's a problem not with the tables not with the missions that's not what i'm saying i'm saying that this will devolve into a problem with V3 if we don't do something. So that is why we need more to rain on tables, because otherwise the gun lines and, and we need a reason to move up. If if you're playing kill points, you don't have a reason to move up. You sit on ambush, you wait for the enemy to lose interest in sitting on ambush and you shoot him as he comes. That's the problem, right? So we need we need a reason to move up. That can be objectives. Um, so if the TO is placing objectives, which I think we should start thinking about and not the players, place them in the center of the board so you have to move up. Um, or it could be anything else. There could be a secondary objective. There could be like a land grab uh, overlay on your missions, something. Um, because, and, and definitely we will need more terrain, more line of side blockers, more hard terrain, hard cover, um, so that you have the ability to move up and so that you have to move up in order to gain line of sight to what you're shooting at. Um, the rest of the games were either draws or um, both players were Active man actively maneuvering about the board, so they don't really count. But but just look at the statistics here, right? Two times more than both being active or a draw was just won outright by the passive player. That's that's why I think that this could be a problem with V three, and for me at least, it's a. It's a static game that is being encouraged here that I don't like. And, and I'm not trying to crap on anyone bringing a gun line or anything. Right, you, you do that because that's the way you win. I'm just saying it's not a game that I enjoy just sitting back and shooting. 
So the solution here is much more terrain. And then there's the related problem of close quarters. Now, a lot of people have been commenting on my videos that it's mostly Gurkha players who are complaining about the new close quarter rules. And uh, I'm going to try and prove you wrong about that. At some point, I'm going to reignite my Gurkhas. Right. I've been off the Gurkhas since at, at least since Madrid, right? Since I went to Madrid and and played in that tournament in the spring, I haven't played my Gurkhas at all. Um, so I've been playing my partisans now. I've been playing Russians um, from the Danish Bold Action Library. Um, and, and going into uh, the V3, I haven't played Gurkhas once. But the Gurkhas are now, in my estimation, one of the only units, there's two units, I think, maybe three, that can now do close combat. The rest of you guys are screwed in close combat, right? Um, but my Gurkhas will still be able to do it. So that's not the problem with close combat. It's not because I'm a Gurkha player and I miss being overpowered in close combat because I almost always in tournaments, I was always fighting simultaneously anyway. I mean, good players, they know how to make sure that I fight simultaneously in version two, right? No, that's not the problem. The problem is that, the, that close combat has gone away as an option and it really has. It was not an option you took unless you were absolutely sure that you were going to win, um, then the problem is that we get, again, something that encourages static play. So the gun lines encourage in st static play and the lack of close quarters encourages static play. In my six games, there was six assaults. And I had brought a couple of units that could assault. Um, I had two cavalry units, tough fighters on all of them, right? Regulars, but, and, and they were small because I knew I wasn't going to assault much. And two scout units with SMGs, also they could assault. There were six assaults in six games, an average of one per game. Three of them ended with the assaulter being dead within two or three dice draws. That is, again, a massive, massive discouragement to anyone assaulting because you're going to lose your unit. They're going to die. One of these six assaults was lost by the assaulter. Um, and I think one of the takeaways for that is also that um, people in those assaults weren't taking the normal V2 assaults where you're like, okay, I'll go first, you're regular, you've got two tough fighters, I'll, I'll try, because uh, I can take you in close combat, right? I'm five men all veterans no 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 they weren't doing that now i was hitting i was hitting small teams the most common target of these assaults i think yeah five of the assaults were against small teams or like one or two three man teams at the most right five of them only one was against a larger unit and that unit had already been cut to pieces by by other fire so point blank is now a much, much better option, especially if you have SMGs. So SMGs is more or less, if you want to have a unit that can deal with other units, that's, that's the only thing you have. That's, you need SMGs. You need veterans with SMGs. And that for me becomes again, a limitation of the options that you have for pushing forward, right? If that's the only way you can do it. Um, and ranged shooting, like seeing back at range is even better. I know it's not as deadly as being on point blank, but it's a lot safer being away from the enemy because you're not at point blank either, right? So again, we have the related problem of encouraging static play. And also, there's a related problem with skirmishes. So skirmishes, without the range, as I said before, are just target practice for the enemy, right? And that's because your two, three riflemen, 
that are skirmishing up or even a six man regular unit of skirmishers because I saw a lot of them people playing six man units seven man units sometimes but five to seven men with um with rifles as old style skirmishers and these guys were just being munched up by veterans with SMGs at close quarters or by auto cannons at range or by LMGs or MMGs or whatever they were being shot to pieces and they had no chance that was why sorry that was what I saw if anyone went and saw something different let me know but that was what I saw regular riflemen are now much less impactful and that is a pity I am sad about the fact that regular riflemen are now just their things to shoot at, right? Backline holders, though, five-man infantry with an LMG are much, much better and much, much safer. Because you can sit in that area to rain, you don't need to move out, you, so you don't get the miners. Uh, you'll, most of the time, you'll hit on a five or a four um, to sit back. Shoot. And again, static gameplay, right? Solution, much more terrain. And then on top of that, we have the problem of armor. In version two, it was generally generally considered uh, that tank platoons were overpowered compared to regular generic reinforced platoon. And that has continued into version three. So the fact that we are allowing armor and we see that 10 out of the 12 top lists in the top group had three plus tanks it does say something right tanks are just better you need tanks if you want to win so um yeah seven out of the 12 had artillery 10 out of 12 had tanks tanks are just good three had multi-rocket launcher spam and the infantry that was in the top bracket was almost all of it LMG armed backline holders. There wasn't really any like skirmish infantry or there was uh, Johnny Curran's uh, engineers, but that was the only like. So all of this makes for a bit of a problem, I think. And uh, I'm going to see if I can solve it. In my own tournaments, I've already posted the next tournament I'm hosting is um, in the new year. That's the, the next one I'm TOing. And there'll, there'll be a lot more terrain on the tables then. And we shall see what that does to V3. So, the takeaways for me, and these are all with huge caveats, right? The, that... Um, World Open War was not a pure V3 tournament. It was a team tournament. All of that. Huge caveats. And these the sample size is small yet. So all of my complaining, take it all with a grain of salt or a huge pinch. Um, but right now, my thought process is that we need more terrain. And that should give us better games, more maneuverable games. Not that I didn't have enjoyable... I, I, all my games were highly enjoyable, but... I think that we need more maneuver. Maneuver is the fun part of this. Um, potentially, we need to look at the force organization chart. Maybe it allows too much spamming. I mean, go back and watch my army for World Open War. I hate, had eight light mortars. That's spamming, right? Um, and and the Finnish lists were spamming out Komsomolets. The German uh, lists were spamming out multi-rocket launchers. Um, so there was a lot of spamming going on. I mean, uh, we had a picture right before of Alistair. Let me go back here. This is Alistair Unicom's um, uh, winter panzers here. Beautifully painted. But he had five Panzer threes, right? Uh, spamming, right? So... We shall see once we have more tournaments what happens. But I, I, I am, as I thought, uh, and this may be confirmation bias, I know, but as I thought, I thought that we were going to see a problem with spamming, and and that is what I'm seeing. Um, infantry much more vulnerable than a V2. You start losing them right away, 
turn one you'll start taking off infantry and it will only increase how many you take off each turn pins really don't matter much um i had two units miss a an order test all weekend from six games and i had 24 units that's not a lot um so pins nah there's simply so many officers to give you that bonus to make your test. And and for some for some people, maybe like um, like Manuel, he had a, a company commander sitting behind his gun line in order to m make them move, right? So if you know you're going to take pins, why not take a commander to make sure you make the, the order tests? That makes sense. But it does mean that pins are now, yeah, not important at all, basically. Um, Fubar, though, there was a lot of units being killed to double sixes. Um, not because they were shooting the, the, their own uh, side, but because if you roll to run away and you reach the edge of the table, you're dead. You're gone. And that happened a lot at World Open War, which is fun. But, I mean, why are we even taking all the order tests if they, they, most of the time, they, I mean, couldn't we just, like, every time we activate a unit, roll two dice, and if, if it's double six, it, the unit dies? Because that's basically what's happening. Most of the other time, the unit just does exactly what we want it to. The whole process of that is maybe not as important as it was. That's a turkey away. At least we shall see what happens going forward. Maybe uh, snipers will start to kill kill all those officers, and that will change up everything. Maybe. So, um, what's next for me? I am going to start releasing games from World of War. I recorded six games. Um, and I'll release the raw footage and just write down when the game actually starts so you guys can sit at home and see a real game. Um, ideally, I would, of course, want there to be like a commentator uh, just talking over that, but I really doubt I have time to sit and do all that um, audio for you guys. Sorry, I would, I would want that, but I, I don't have the time in my life. I, I have a day job as well. Um, but I will start rec uh, releasing the recorded games and I will also go over my own games. I'll make bad reps for those. Um, so that will be coming up. I also expect that I'll uh, do an interview uh, with Russell, the TO from World Open War, just to recap and see what he's seeing, see if he is seeing some of the same things, some of the same trends that I'm seeing what he thinks of it, and, and he does a lot more um, statistical analysis than I do. I do, like, I just use my uh, analytical skills and just, you know, <clears throat> feel the game, I guess. Expertise, let's call it expertise. Um, but he does a lot more statistical analysis, so that would be cool to hear. At the end here, I just want to say thank you to the Danes that went. Jan Peterson, who fought for the Barbarians uh, again. He had his 101st game of the year at the tournament, beating the uh, the old Danish re record for uh, most games in a year, which was held by Steen. Um, so Jan is now the, the Dane ha that has played the most game in a, games in a single year. Congratulations, Jan. Uh, also to Torben, who stepped up and was a reserve player for the Dutch team when they suddenly lacked one guy. Thank you so much to Torben. Um, been a real pleasure to travel with you as well. David and Michael C. Uh, made Denmark 2 or Germany 2. Um, Originally with a uh, with Maddy, a German player, but he unfortunately had to step out. Step out, uh, so they had a, a replacement player come in. They were also absolute gentlemen, fought well. Mixed nuts uh, ended up in bracket 
three, I think. And then, of course, my team uh, here, seen on the right, um, no, the left for you guys, right, uh, is is Michael Fia, and then me in the middle, and then Christian. So um, this year, Michael is the reigning Danish champion. I'm, of course, a former Danish champion, and uh, Christian is the second-ranked player in Denmark. Um, so, yeah. That was it. Uh, also, a massive thank you to Russell and to Gary, the TOs for World Open War, and the hosts for all their hard work. It was a very enjoyable weekend. It was lovely seeing you guys again. Very smooth tournament. The issues that were were few and far between and handled in a timely manner. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I will see you in the next video. Cheers.